Welcome everyone to the Economic Club of New York. This is Barbara Van Allen, president of the club. We will get started in exactly two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the 539th meeting of the Economic Club of New York. I'm Marie-Jose Kravis, the chair of the Economic Club of New York and a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Uh, the Economic Club of New York is the nation's leading nonpartisan forum for discussion of economic, social, and political issues. And I want to extend a special welcome today to guests of our members, um, members of the Economic Club of Chicago and of Washington, D.C., who uh, have also been invited to, invited to join the webinar today. And I'm also delighted to have joining us the members of the Economic Club of New York 2020 Class of Fellows. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our healthcare workers and all of our frontline workers for all they do during these difficult times to keep us healthy and safe. I'd also like to add uh, that we all grieve for George Floyd and his family and our fellow citizens who in the past and currently have uh, sometimes been victims of prejudice, injustice, and violence. We know that um, to tackle the scientific or the health crisis, we are putting our best scientific minds to work to try to resolve um, this, this crisis. And hopefully with regard to this uh, later crisis, we'll put our best minds and also our best hearts to work to try to find solutions uh, for our country. It's a pleasure for me today to introduce um, our guest, uh, Ambassador Robert Lighthizer, uh, who was sworn in as the 18th United States Special Trade Representative on May 15th, 2017. Ambassador Lighthizer uh, was chosen uh, by President Trump uh, at a time when he was serving as partner of the law firm Skadden Arps a slate meager and um, where he practiced international trade law for over 30 years. His work there on behalf of American workers and businesses in the heavy manufacturing, agricultural, high tech and financial services industries opened markets to U.S. exports and defended U.S. industries from unfair trade practices. He was lead counsel for scores of trade enforcement cases and was a well-known advocate the type of America first trade policies supported by President Trump. Before joining Skadden, the ambassador served as deputy STR for President Ronald Reagan. And during his tenure, he negotiated over two dozen bilateral international agreements, including agreements on steel, automobiles, and agricultural products. As deputy US STR, he also served as vice chairman of the board of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Prior to becoming Deputy SDR Ambassador Lighthizer, was Chief of Staff of the United States Senate Committee on Finance for Chairman Bob Dole. In this position, he was a key player in enacting the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981, which included major tax reform, as well as other basic elements of the Reagan economic program. Most recently, um, Ambassador Lighthizer has been very busy um, renegotiating the uh, U.S.-South Korea agreement, trade agreement, the U.S.-Japan and um, U.S.-Japan agreement, the uh, U.S.-MCA, the replacement to NAFTA, the China phase one uh, trade deal, and he's just embarked in bilateral negotiations uh, with the United Kingdom. And I've, I'm only highlighting his busiest or the most well-known uh, agreements that he's focused on. He's been busy in many other, <laughs> many other issues. So the format today will be a conversation of, well, first of all, a presentation and a few remarks by Ambassador Lighthizer, and then a conversation which I'm fortunate to be moderating. I, will, I have incorporated, and I'll try to incorporate in the conversation, questions that were sent by members. We'll end promptly at 2.45, and um, on that note, uh, over to you, Ambassador Lighthizer, and thank you so much for being with us today. Well, well, thank you very much, Marie Jose. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I'm honored to appear before the uh, Economic uh, Club, the New York Economic Club, and 
I'd like to thank you for all you do there, but also at the Hudson Institute, of which I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I should begin the same way you did, and that is to say uh, how badly we in the administration feel about, about uh, George Floyd, but the whole, the whole process, this whole issue, which is playing its, itself out right now in the United States, uh, it's, uh, it's legitimate grievances and the protesters who, who we are sympathetic to. Uh, we're not sympathetic to the rioters, and the president is very much, uh, as, as people know, uh, on the side of getting us back to normal. Uh, but but uh, these are real grievances, and there's something that everyone should take a moment and pause about, because we all have a part in them. Uh, I'd also like to express my condolences to, to all the people who have been affected by this uh, COVID-19. I mean, the we, if you, it's hard to even remember what we all thought before this uh, virus struck this country. It seems like it was a hundred years ago, and and to think that a hundred thousand people have died, and many many people have had their lives really, really destroyed because of this virus. It's very sad, and and I sort of, I, you know, completely agree with you on the, the, the. We've made some new heroes in this in this country, and there's a there's a variety of them in in the medical area and the like. It. It, it's funny, on the one hand, it makes you think that, that what we're talking about is less important, but in another way, maybe it's more important because we have to build the lives uh, through economics and economic policy and rebuild the lives of these people uh, who, have, who have been affected by this virus or, or, or by the rioting or people who, who have been negatively affected by the, the issues that, that are being protested. So um, yeah, these are interesting times. Uh, they were interesting before COVID, and we got a lot done, and we've gotten a lot done in the middle of it. Uh, I think we should remind ourselves at the beginning that the economy was very, very good before this this uh, this scourge hit the country. Uh, we had record unemployment. It was doing good for for I think for all Americans. And the thing that I'm happiest about really was that we we brought so many people who had been out of the workforce back into the workforce. And I think that's really a fundamental thing that the president did, and that's African Americans and Hispanic Americans, but uh, a lot of Caucasian Americans also who had taken themselves out or had been re really not let into the workforce were now brought back in. So there was a lot of good things the president accomplished a lot. We had a tax bill, which was historic. We had deregulation, which was historic. Uh, and we had these trade uh, agreements that you talked about, as well as a variety of other things. So. The first thing I think we have to remind ourselves is that while we're in a crisis now, we were in a good place before, and thank God we were, uh, because that means it's going to be more likely that we can get to the other side of it and really have a very, very vibrant economy again and, and have people return to their lives and, and, and really prosperity really from the top to the bottom. Now, now, my area, as you say, is trade, and that's part of economic policy. Um, the president has a different view. I have a different view on what trade policy is about, and that's why we've renegotiated agreements on the like. We start with the proposition that there is a problem, uh, that the way we were going for the last decades was not maximizing the benefit to American workers and farmers and ranchers. Uh, it, it, would, it, 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 uh, it led to a country that was, in my opinion at least, and I think the opinion of the president, divided and moving in the direction of, of division between rich people and, and poor people, or rich people and, and lower middle class people. So uh, we, I cite as evidence of that, the fact that we have trade deficits that were enormous and, and over a long period of time. Now I know many people listening will say trade deficits don't matter and, and certainly bilateral trade deficits uh, in a normal circumstance have limited uh, uh, importance. But when you have hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of trade deficits. And with most of the world, it's reasonable to say something ought to change. You know, we ought to look at the rules of trade and that's what the president has asked me to do. Further evidence is the loss of manufacturing jobs. I know some of your members will say, well, it's productivity, but I think it was a lot more than productivity. Um, so, and then, and then when you looked at the details of trade, you saw a lot of unfairness. You saw a lot of places with high, with high, uh, high tariffs. Them, much, much higher than ours, and trade barriers. It made it difficult for American uh, companies and workers and farmers to compete. So I would, I would say that's more or less where we started. The president's objective is not solely on efficiency and efficiency for companies and efficiency in the marketplace. It is that to some extent, 
but it's also he wants jobs. He starts off with the proposition that we want more Americans with better paying jobs. If we have that, we'll have a better community, and that's in all our interest. And he, he approached trade with that as his objective, and, and you've seen the results. First, we, we renegotiated NAFTA uh, and made the USMCA, which is the biggest trade agreement ever made in history, uh, $1.3 trillion worth of trade, and we made it we made it modern. We made it the absolute gold standard in areas of digital trade and financial services and the like. Uh, but also, we began the process of bringing a lot of manufacturing jobs back to the United States. And I think it's also good, by the way, for Mexico and Canada. So I think it was a great, great success. Um, we did the deal with, um, I should say, by the way, on USMCA, it goes into effect July 1. So I expect you all to have some kind of a party there at the uh, New York <laughs> Economic Club to celebrate. It has to be a virtual one. party. <laughs> I'm, and, and I'm going to come, uh, you know, virtually to the party when you have it. So, and then we did a a, a very historic deal with Japan, involving agriculture and e-commerce, and I think 40 or 50 billion dollars worth of trade. We, as you say, the South Korea deal was renegotiated. We did a lot of other very small deals, individual products and problems involving various agricultural industrial policies. But but we also did and signed on January 15th the phase one deal with China. And I think a lot of people are very interested in that, and they should be. Uh, it, was a, it was an historic deal. It was really the first real uh, trade deal that we had ever done with China. We'd had a very imbalanced relationship for a long period of time. And I think this agreement, this phase one agreement, is the beginning of, of rewriting the rules and, and, and correcting the relationship so that it's in both of our, our interests. So I'll stop there. Uh, uh, people are going to ask me about China, I know, and, and maybe NAFTA and other things. Uh, and I'm also happy to talk about uh, the UK agreement, which we've just begun renegotiating, and Kenya, which you didn't mention. It's the president's view and certainly my view that, that we're going to look back in 20 years and say we should have done something in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a very important part of the world. Uh, the United States has generally not been involved as much as we should have there. Uh, and and in 20 years, it could have uh, 2 billion people living there. So it's really, really important that we begin to, 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 to make a, uh, some, some integration of, of, of their economies and ours. So why don't I stop there? I've probably spoken too long. I'm happy to answer questions. Look Not forward enough. to getting into all these issues. Well, we'll maybe we'll go into the specific trade agreements as we go along. But just as a general question, and and you've highlighted all of you know so many of these separate agreements, you've tended to take more of a bilateral approach to trade negotiations than a multilateral approach, a WTO approach, and so on. Could you elaborate on that? What you're thinking, what the thinking is behind that, why that was so, the chosen so, avenue? Yes, uh, I, I mean I have felt for a long time, and I know the president has also, that that the United States is the biggest economy in the world can do better negotiating country on country. That is not to say we wouldn't have any international involvement in the WTO, but, but for the most part, if you're the biggest economy in the world, you'll make sure you get a fairer deal if you use your bilateral leverage. When you sit down in a multilateral context, you end up making concessions to one country that you might not have to make to another. Now, ultimately what we want is a mix. And I would say this, I think it's important when we think about this, we have been uh, uh, accused of and have, in fact, engaged on a bilateral basis more than prior prior administrations. But, but I want people out there to think about what has Europe done, because Europe complains about our bilateralism. Europe over the last 70, over the last maybe 15 years, uh, has accelerated their bilateral, their FTA negotiations to the point now that they have 77 different FTA uh, agreements, which means another way of putting that is they give better than MFN treatment to 77 countries. Now, tell me that isn't really a bilateral approach. Europe talks let me just about say it for our world. listeners that I'm, let me just say for our listeners that MFN is most favored nation. Just oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm, I, it's okay. I, should, I, I, I plead guilty to that. I, I know how sophisticated I, I didn't want your to members interrupt. are. Sorry. Well, I, I, your, member, your members all know, but there might be a guest who doesn't. That's, that's my right. assumption. So it's good. 
So I mean, I hear this criticism. I think one, it makes more sense for us. And two, it's the, the Europeans and others are doing exactly the same thing. In many ways, Europe is far, far more of a bilateral trade. Even though they talk about multilateralism, they're doing more to harm the, 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 the multilateral system through all these FTAs by far than we are. But, but I think it makes sense. We'll see how it works out. I, I've always believed you're better off uh, if you're the biggest economy in the world negotiating fair rules on a bilateral basis. So do you, does that mean with or WTO, the World Trade Organization? See, now, if I had said WTO, would people really, my <laughs> guess is that they would have figured it out. Uh, no, no, I, I'm, uh, I'm not in favor of, of, of getting out of the WTO. I've been very critical of it, uh, as, has, as has my boss. Uh, it has really, uh, I think, not served us well. The dispute settlement process has turned into basically a forum for litigation, and it really shouldn't be that. The WTO, if you look back since the Uruguay round in 1994, we've had essentially no real trade negotiations. We had one trade facilitation agreement, but, but that was really you know, kind of custom stuff. We've had no trade agreement. Why would, why would, I mean, no serious trade negotiations. We had the start of a Doha round, but it just petered out. Why would that be? Part of the reason is the WTO has morphed from a negotiating forum into a court, into a litigation, and it's not set up for that. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a clumsy way to, to, to do trade policy. So uh, we have a lot of criticisms of the WTO, but I think you do need a body that, that hosts negotiations and that keeps track of what the agreements are. Uh, and the WTO does that. And we're looking forward to, you know, to reforming the WTO as time goes on. So let's go to the specific trade agreements. And of course, I'm, so I have received so many questions from members about, about China and about phase one. And let's start with a general question because you had mentioned that um, the success of the Chinese trade agreement is going to depend on China, on whether the reformers are able to see it through. It's still, I mean, it was only January. It's as you said, it seems like it was 100 years ago. The January 15th seems like 100 years ago, but it's only been uh, a few months. But what is your sense as to the commitment to the to the phase one agreement? So, so I feel very good about it. First of all, let's remind ourselves how we got here. We had a very unbalanced economic relationship with China. I mean, I would say by far the most unbalanced of any two countries in the history of the world, by far. And it was not just the result of economic forces. It was the result of state capitalism and of various kinds of unfair trade, which I won't uh, uh, list here because it's not a positive thing to do. But we had a, we had a grievance, we had a problem, we had a trade deficit which ballooned up to over $400 billion and it went up and up and up and up. And it was not the result of market efficiency. It was more the result of state capitalism. So that's what that's where we started. Uh, uh, to their credit, China engaged in good faith negotiations. It went on again, it went off again. Uh, we began with a study that, that went on for eight months in, in 2017. This has been a, a steady, uh, uh, planned uh, trade policy by the president. Um, and we we looked at, at questions of, of forced technology transfer, of, of IP theft, uh, and a variety of other similar kinds of, uh, of, of, of grievances. At the end of that, we had a study, a very, very well-received study, I think, a very scholarly study. Uh, we went through a period when uh, when we escalated tariffs back and forth, and we ended up now with a situation where we have uh, large tariffs and an attempt, I think, by both both sides to try to work our way through this. Now, in, in my case, when people talk about China, as you alluded, I always say that China is not like one thing. China is a lot of different people and they have a lot of different interests. And like the United States over a period of time, they have a way of working out who's on top. And if, if the reformers, the people who want to have a good relationship with the United States, 
uh, if if they have their way, then I think we're going to have a then, then we're going to see the phase one agreement become an historic, historic uh, first agreement between the two biggest economies in the world. And and I would say at this point, remember, it, it was signed in January, it was effective on Valentine's Day. Uh, so and 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 they and in many ways, it was March 1st before they could get some of their things in place. So if you look at what they've done since March First, and given the context of this crazy virus, I think they've done a pretty good job. We have to remind ourselves this is it's it's two things: it's structural change, which is to say, in the area of technology transfer and and financial services and currency and intellectual property protection uh, and agriculture, and then it's enforceable. And I think the fact that it's enforceable and covers these substantive structural things is often lost by people who just focus on the last part, which is it also involves a commitment to a certain amount of, of purchases. And, and I would say on the structural changes that, that China has done a, a, a pretty good job. And I think under the circumstances, they're committed to, to live up to the agreement on the, on the purchases side also. And we've seen significant purchases uh, over the course of the last uh, uh, many weeks. So I feel pretty good about it. You know, we'll we'll find out. It's one of those things where it, you know you'll you'll know what the score is. You know, before too long. But I, I think the people with whom I negotiated this, who are honorable people, uh, want it to be a success. I know that um, that the uh, the uh, the premier uh, indicated over there in, the, in his speech to the Congress that they expect to live up to the agreement, and I know the president expects to live up to the agreement. There were recent reports, or I, I wish I should say rumors rather than reports, uh, that perhaps they would not live up to their uh, commitment to purchase the uh, U.S. soybeans. Was that uh, was that accurate? No, it wasn't. It's interesting. I it was one of these things. It's anything you're involved with. Anyone listening out there. When you see somebody write about it in the paper, you say, whoa, that's not how it was. No, I don't know where that report came from. The reality is that on Monday and Tuesday of this week, which is after that report, China bought $185 million worth of soybeans. So that, that is not true. Uh, the people that I deal with tell me it's not true. And, and I, expect, uh, I expect you'll see them live up to their agreement. And, and we certainly expect them to. So I, I did see those reports. I thought they were disruptive and unhelpful. Uh, and I, but I don't know where they came from. I don't know whether it was bad sourcing or or intentional misinformation on behalf of somebody somewhere. But 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 we don't believe they're true. Now, obviously, the context has uh, been altered somewhat with the COVID-19 uh, issue and the back and forth as to China's role in uh, in sharing information and being transparent and uh, it's, it's overall role in the management of the of the crisis. Do you think that that's going to have an impact on uh, the implementation of the trade agreement? Well, all right. So, so let me just tell you first of all how I address these things. I, uh, I mean, clearly China has a lot of uh, there's a lot of blame that can go China's way in this whole area. But as I say, when you talk about China, it's it's a it's a process rather than a thing, right? And it's a process with a lot of people. The same thing is true of our relationship. We have a very complicated relationship. I have been someone who have been critical of the relationship for for a number of years. But the relationship involves security. It involves the economy and trade. It involves science. It involves cyber theft. It involves a lot of different things. The way I approach it is, I stay in my lane. I can't solve all the problems between the United States and China. What I can do is try to negotiate an agreement that, that, that begins the process of balancing our relationship and helps Americans have you know, more and better jobs. That's what I'm trying to do. And, and I would, uh, th there's an awful lot of criticism in a lot of other areas, by the way, security areas, cyber theft, there's a, uh, and, and of course the virus that can go China's way, but that's not my job. My, if I try to do that, I'll end up doing nothing. So what, what I wanna do is work with the people there who wanna have a good relationship, try to write rules that are, that are new and fair and work for, for both of us, but mostly work for American workers and, 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 and farmers. And if I do that, I will have, I will have uh, uh, spent my time well. 
But I mean, in, in, I hate to bring you back to the COVID crisis, but uh, there has been a lot of discussion relating to our vulnerabilities, especially to pharmaceutical and medical medicine, uh, you know, the, whether it's uh, antibiotics or ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Uh, we were highly dependent on China for many of these, many of these drugs. Do you see any change there? Was, and how would that, I mean, as, as companies look at their supply chains and look at, you know, better, more resilience in their supply chains, and as we try to minimize some of our vulnerabilities, that's certainly going to have an impact on the relation on the trade relationship, don't you think? Well, I think it'll have an impact on the trade relationship with China, with India, and with a lot of other countries. The United States, in my opinion, needs to bring these supply chains back. We need to make in America what we need in a crisis in America. And there's two ways to think about that. One way is, well, let's get rid of all, all, the, all the trade barriers. And during the crisis, for sure, that's true. But I would suggest that after the crisis is over, we have to have an industrial policy that assures that the United States has, in any future crisis, the ability to manufacture at home all the things that we need. Now, that means medicine, but it also needs PPE. We don't have to say to anybody what PPE is, do we? I don't People. think so, I think. <laughs> so, so we need to be able to manufacture the high-tech stuff, the medicine, the low-tech stuff. That should be part of our industrial policy. The president feels very strongly that way. I know a lot of people in Congress uh, are looking at that and we need a policy, be it uh, subsidies or tariffs or whatever, whatever it takes, we have to have industrial policy. So we never find ourselves in this position again, where we're not uh, um, independent on matters that are really real, on, on uh, material that's really, really important to the country. And now we're you a mentioned, big enough country, I should say, we're a big enough country that we can do that, right? A small country would be harder. The United States can do that. We have the technology, we have the ability to make all of these products through a whole, particularly in the pharmaceutical area, through a whole lot of, a number of years and people not paying attention, we've allowed this to drift in, in one direction. You know, bad tax policy, a whole lot of bad decisions were made, policy decisions in the United States that got us into this position. And we, we just have to correct it. And I think the president will correct it. So let's go to another part of the world um, because uh, we could have this whole conversation only on China, but uh, the relationship with Canada and Mexico is also, as you mentioned, uh, the largest trade deal to be concluded. It's also an important one. Um, how do you think um, each of those countries is, um, well, we, we don't know yet because <laughs> it comes into, into force uh, later this year, but um, thus far, do you think that they are abiding by their commitments? So, uh, yes, I think they have. I think they they will. And I think if they don't, we'll, we'll use dispute uh, settlement process and we'll bring actions against them. But look at this is this is the biggest market in the world. It's just a, a gigantic market. There are a lot of reasons why we should have a relationship with Canada and also Mexico and that it should be mutually beneficial. Before the president decided to renegotiate, the, the agreement became very, very out of balance. If you look at before we started to negotiate, of the 11 automobile plants built in North America, eight of them were built in Mexico, just as an example. All right, eight of them. And almost all the cars are sold in the United States. Now, to some extent, that was a, a labor arbitrage. But to, a, to another extent, it was industrial policy by, by the Mexicans. And, and US, uh, US governments who just let it happen. And, and I think that was a mistake. We, you and I remember the great debate over NAFTA and Ross Perot and the sucking sound. And I think in, in, in recent years, that was very, very true. And it became an extremely, extremely unpopular agreement. Uh, both presidential candidates in the last two or three elections have said, Democrats and Republicans, we need to renegotiate it. Nobody did. We lost. We lost literally millions of jobs in the United States, and these are good middle-class jobs that we lost in the United States. And this president ran on and then said, "We are going to renegotiate this agreement, or we're not going to have an agreement." And I think that was the right approach. We got a very good agreement. As I said, it's the gold standard on on the what some people call the new economy. Uh, but 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 to me at least, and on and on agriculture. But to me at least, even more importantly, it will. 
It will stop the flow of, of jobs out of the United States, manufacturing jobs. It'll bring an awful lot of them back, and it'll 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 add to the middle class and the general wealth of this country. And at the same time, because we 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 constructed the rules of origin uh, so as to help the whole region, it'll be good for Mexico. It'll be good for Canada, but it'll really be good for the United States. And and we'll see. People forget, and they shouldn't, uh, how unpopular and how unsuccessful, except for a few people in the United States, that agreement was. And now I think we we righted the ship. We did something no one thought was possible, and that is to get an overwhelming majority of Republicans and Democrats in the House and Senate to vote for it. We had every agriculture group in favor of it, the labor unions, uh, the big labor unions were in, in favor of it. All the business groups were in favor of it. So so now we'll see. We 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 did our 168-page uniform regulations got out yesterday, July 1, as I say. We we're going to come and have the big party at the club. Uh, we'll be beginning of it. And I think you've already seen people take action uh, to bring jobs back just in anticipation and planning. So I think it's going to be very good for the country. It's interesting that you mentioned both Democrats and Republicans uh, working on this agreement. I'd say with regard to China also, there seems to be a convergence among certain members of Congress and, and the Senate um, with regard to, you know, the changing position on China or changing views on China. Um, do you find that maybe there's more convergence now on, on economic policy, that it's um, that there, there, that there is a new... Um, a new consensus that's shaping in Washington, or is that just an illusion from the outside? Um, I, I, I'm not one to prematurely predict uh, that, that things are going to be harmonious or that there's going to be uh, a new working together. I uh, that that may be, we may be decades or maybe never to see that. I do think on USMCA uh, there were a lot of very important provisions, and the Democrats made a contribution in, in a lot of areas. Uh, just like the Republicans did, and so we work closely with both of them. And on China, I think you're absolutely right. There have been a number of, of people who have been very worried about that relationship uh, and, and and for a long period of time, but there were others who, who had a different view or, or really didn't focus on it. And I think there is a consensus in the United States that we have to have a better relationship with, with, with China, that China has taken advantage of the United States and that uh, and that uh, has treated us unfairly, not just in the economic sphere, but in the security sphere, uh, sphere and others. So I, I do believe there's that consensus. And, and there have been some people who have had that view for a long time. The speaker's a good example. The speaker's had that view for a long time. Uh, the president's had that view for decades and, 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 and others in the, in the Congress. So I, I do believe there's a bipartisan uh, uh, consensus on, on both of these issues. Uh, when you get much beyond that, I'm not, I'm not so sure. Although, you know, having said that, we did pass what, almost, what, what three trillion dollars worth of stimulus. So, I mean, there's, there are a lot of things to, to, you know, to, to, to feel good about if that's your, 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 uh, your predisposition. Well, I was really focusing more on trade and nothing else. But um, let's talk about the UK because you've just uh, formally started negotiations with the United Kingdom, and uh, that comes in. Uh, Maybe a delayed uh, context of Brexit with uh, with COVID and so on. There doesn't that seems to have been put on the back burner. But um, what are the what, where what are the areas that you're most focused on with regard to the UK? Well, this is going to be you know it should be a, a good agreement once again for both of us. We have similar economies. We have a long long history of working together. We have 269 billion dollars worth of two way trade already. And, and interestingly, each of us employs, through investment in the other country, about a million people, citizens of the other country. So there's a close relationship there already. But we want to have a full-blown free trade agreement with the United Kingdom. Uh, we, we think this is an opportunity. Right now, they have a very unbalanced trade relationship with, with the European Union, as do we. And, and this is an opportunity, I think, for each of us to to sell more product to each other uh, and, and, and uh, um, perhaps increase trade. So, you know, we feel good at one of the areas we're going to, we're looking at not only the areas of, of e-commerce and financial services, we're both, by the way, enormous uh, service industries. 
uh, you know, service economy. So there's a lot of the headway that can be made on that. We're looking forward to that. Agriculture is a very big issue for us. And we, we have the, 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 the best uh, agriculture in the world. We have the most efficient agriculture in the world. We expect to make real headway there. And then there, there are a variety of industrial areas also. So it's an across the board. It's going to be a free trade agreement that I think is going to be good for, for both countries. It's going to take time. To be honest, these things are not negotiated. We negotiated uh, with three countries, the USMCA, in about a year. And that was probably you know, a fourth of what anyone would have done under normal circumstances. So these things take time, both because they're complicated, but also because each of us has to, has to wrap ourselves around the fact that there's going to be compromise. So uh, I, it's going to take a while, but we're, we're, it's not going to um, go for lack of resources. So we're, we're both working on it hard. Uh, 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 our minister, Liz Truss, is, is, is um, you know, a good partner in this, and, and we're looking forward to making headway. Our second round begins the week after next on the 15th of, of June. We're in the process of laying down text. There's a lot of text. These things are, you know, uh, a couple thousand pages long. At the end of the day, they're very, very difficult and complicated. But, but I, but I feel good about about us getting there. You mentioned services, um, and I wonder if you, if there's any appetite anywhere in the world, and especially in the United States, for some kind of trade agreement regarding that covers services more broadly because the u.s certainly has a comparative advantage in many sectors related to services yes so so uh, um the, one of our initiatives is is in e-commerce which is related uh, but services specifically yes the united states we believe we have a a comparative advantage interestingly the the uk thinks that they have a comparative advantage one of the anomalies that you find when you get it and spend a lot of time in the trade area is that the the numbers tend to be a little bit screwy so when we look at the uk and the united states each of us believes that we have a 12 billion dollar approximate surplus with the other uh services numbers are hard to figure out what they are when when you think of services or i think of them a lot of people it's it's financial services it's insurance it's it's uh um, uh, Retail. financial management, the like. What 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 it tends to be in most of our economies is uh, is healthcare, and in trade mm -hmm. it tends to be uh, travel and tourism and education. But uh, but but clearly financial services is an area where the United States views itself as having a real real competitive advantage. Interestingly, so does the UK. We we you know compared to the rest of the world, we may both be right. Now, some of the members sent questions relating to climate because, uh, for example, the European Union will not sign a trade agreement uh, with a counterpart who, that has not signed the Paris Agreement. Is that correct? And um, how do you, does that impede any further progress in negotiations with any European country? So, so, so we have a negotiation of sorts going on with the European Union. We have a very unbalanced uh, relationship there. Uh, we have a hundred and eighty billion dollar goods deficit, and it's growing. So it's something the president is focused on, and we have to do something about. Uh, I have read and heard the European Union say they won't enter into an agreement with with anyone uh, uh, that, that that doesn't have a uh, a um, climate change provision and it you know you know we'll see we're not close to having any kind of agreement with them so it's at this point at least not my problem we'll see what happens as we move along do you think that the europeans speaking of the europeans that will go back full circle to china um talked about now uh china as a strategic rival they've changed their rhetoric uh, on china so do you see maybe uh, more of a partnership with europe in your negotiations or maybe phase two the approach to uh, the china trade to a china trade deal well we have uh for three years had what we call a trilateral group and it's europe the united states and japan and we work on these issues in involving uh, china and how the rules could be changed in a way that 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 uh, helps uh, uh market economies and eliminate some of the uh, some of the ill effects of of uh, uh, we believe of state capitalism. So we we have worked with them on that. 
Uh, the Japanese have been good partners. The Europeans from time to time are good partners, but we have worked together on that. Um, uh, there, Europe is a little bit like when I say China is a lot of different people and a process. So is Europe, and there are parts of Europe that are that that are that, that understand the, the 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 fact that we have to change the rules with respect to China better than others. Uh, but I think we are making headway in that in that score, and it's for sure true that over the last couple of years, the attitude that Europe has had on these issues has trained dramatically, not just in, tra in trade, but also in investment. You've seen them sort of, in my opinion, at least wake up to the fact that they have to take on this issue and we have to have new and better rules. So just in closing, I'd like to maybe say a few, if you could say a few words about Kenya and the African, the African continent, because you're right, it's a huge, uh, huge area, huge, demographic uh, there'll be huge demographic growth there but hopefully also uh, economic growth and more engagement in the world economy so maybe a few words on kenya so so there's a long process in using trade promotion authority which is our fast track uh, legislation mm -hmm. which allows bills to pass see i'm explaining all this now because you've sensitized me to the fact <laughs> that people know my jargon so there's a long process it's been going on for several months we've consulted with congress there's a lot of support in congress the president is strongly in favor of it we have met twice uh with president uh, kenyatta and i and i think they are very much uh, they very much want to move forward uh um he wants to, he wants reform he wants he wants the kind of rules that allow their country to move forward so I'm optimistic. It's a big issue, and there are a lot of, uh, I mean, a big, big uh, negotiation. There are a lot of issues we have to work our way through. It's it's not going to be easy. We'll probably kick it off because of the timing of our legislation. We'll probably kick it off uh, early in, in July. And at that point, we'll do the best we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, through these kind of video conferences. And then at some point, we'll sit down and really hash things out but it'll it, and that also will take time but i think it's really really important that we we have one african country that we really have a good agreement with europe has has a bunch of agreements but they're really not very uh, uh um complete and they're not very high standards china has some activity there uh so it's important the united states have a real what we would consider to be a really really good agreement and then hopefully over a period of time it'll move from not just Kenya, but to other countries. China, I mean, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, itself is in the process of, of integrating their economy. So they're making a lot of headway down there. And it's, it's, it's the perfect time for the United States, I think, to, to move in and, and try to get the rules right for, for everyone. Well, thank you. We could go on and on. And uh, the only thing we I think we all hope is that global trade does pick up because it is a, an important component of the world economy. And Thank you so much for everything you're doing and thank you for taking the time to share with us and um, good luck in all of these uh, in all of these negotiations. So thank you. Well, thank and you. To it's our a member. pleasure to be here. And one thing I can Wonderful. promise, trade will come back. Yes, and you also you'll come back at least July 1st, if not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to say to our members, thank you for being here and reminding you that we have more events uh, planned. So upcoming next week, we have Paul Tudor Jones, the founder and co-chairman of Tudor Investments, who'll be with us on June 9th. And then we have Ellen Zentner, the chief U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley, and Elena Botello and Bill McNabb, the former chairman and CEO of Vanguard, uh, will be with us um, on June 18th. So please um, stay um, connected to our website to follow what we what we're doing. And uh, please stay safe. And as I said, stay tuned and uh, hope to see you next week or see you at least virtually. Thank you again.